Stealth by Roy R. Chavala. In a dark, empty hangar, a needle-like black, flat fighter rested in its cradle, thinking. You see, General, a small man in white gestured toward the ship. Those pods mounted beneath each wing is the main armament, magnetic rail guns. They are able to launch a projectile the size of a soccer ball at a transonic speed within their 7 meter length. Each wing serves as a magazine and carries 70 combined solid and nuclear rounds. The turrets mounted on top and bottom are automatic and purely defensive. They only come into play while the ship is exposed when firing. That's all very well and good, Doctor, the General said wearily. But I want to find out more about the propulsion system. What I read, is it true? The General is aware of the PK work we are conducting? Yes, but I thought it was all theory. The doctor chuckled. No, my dear general, we have entered the practical phase. It sits before you. Perhaps I had better explain, he said, removing his glasses. The concept of PK, that is, telekinesis and telepathy, have been around for millennia, but it has only been in the past 50 years we could select for it in vitro, and only in the past 15 years have we been able to employ it to move objects as large as this with the aid of a PK amplifier. Simply put, since the speed of thought is, as far as we know, instantaneous, the ship simply appears out of nowhere, fires, and then disappears. It's only vulnerable for a few seconds, hence the turret-mounted automatics. How does the pilot operate the ship? Well, the doctor continued, the first attempts were standard. The pilot simply sat in a cockpit and thought where the craft where he wanted it to be, but their thoughts were limited to the speed that their bodies could react to, and he shook his head sadly. There were many many casualties. We tried linking directly to the PK amplifier. This was much more effective. However, the men tended to overcompensate in their movements, leading to similar results. Our third attempt was similar to the second, but this time we linked the men to the PK amplifier through a virtual construct that simulated a cockpit, but run at a speed approximating that of thought. Unfortunately, after long periods on duty, the men had trouble adjusting to normal speed. There were incidents. So, is that all behind us now? The Mark IV is ready for testing? General Kakarov asked, running his hand across the sleek black hull. Oh yes, it is, the doctor said gleefully. You see, after PK and pilot training in simulators at normal speed, the pilot is sedated unawares. His entire central nervous system is removed and implanted into the ship's core. So, he is the ship? No, sir. He is merely in the ship. Through a VR construct, he runs his missions and leads a normal life off-duty. Booze, women, gambling, what have you. All virtual, of course. And they don't realize that their life is a simulation? No, sir. He can't hear us? No, sir, there are no external audio pickups. Any necessary outside contact is sent through his virtual commander. After that, he's allowed to follow his own life, within the parameters of the construct, of course. You mentioned telepathy. Can he? Both sets of turrets swiveled and fixed on the two men. Oh, sh was the last thing Kaskarov ever said. The Iceman Cometh by Roy R. Chavala. They think we are unaware during the freeze. They say our brain activity is too low for rational thought. At best, they say we might experience vague, fleeting, dreamlike states. They think we sleep. They're wrong. It's been two years since our last thaw. It's been two years in which to think, two years to plan, two years to become seriously pissed off. As the thaw begins, our orders and classes in the weapons and equipment we'll be using are given to us intravenously. Small electric currents are fed through our bodies to stimulate and exercise long dormant muscles. A high protein carbosteroidal soup is pumped into us directly to get us battle ready. I'd prefer a beer. Their failing was in thinking that we were asleep in cryo. They have no idea that the brain feed works both ways. While well, they're monitoring us, we're monitoring them. They never expected us to learn, never expected us to communicate with each other in cryo or communicate with the other ships to the other icemen, let alone distant planet surfaces. They didn't plan nor expect us to have any knowledge or even goals beyond our military download. How wrong they are. How arrogant. Finally, the thaw is complete. 29 of us emerge from our lockers. The non-cryos refer to them as cryostasis emergent tanks. 
but they are identical to our lockers and garrison, sans the vent holes. There are 29 cryos in this dropship, plus our lieutenant, a non-cryo, and a handful of other NCs to run the ship. We are drop troops, the Icemen, little more than bombs sheathed in flesh, set to explode in a fury of berserker combat, an expendable weapon as far as they are concerned. If we survive the fray, and usually we do, all the better. It means promotion. For the CO, we're just ammo. If we're terminated, oh well, they can always grow more. We draw our combat loads and fall into formation to await any updates to our previously downloaded orders. Our lieutenant takes command from our platoon sergeant. Funny how our commanders are all non-cryos, and therefore non-combatants. It's like they don't trust us. <laughs> that make me laugh. Gentlemen, our lieutenant speaks in something less than a manly voice. As you are aware, there has been an uprising in the Martian Confederation, and we have been called upon to quell the disturbance. Rebels are cybos. Cybos. He spits the word out like a racial invective. The reason, the little NC prick continued, for the soldier's treachery is uncertain at this time, but you have been ordered to eliminate the problem with extreme prejudice. You have all been issued atomics to achieve this end. You drop in 20 minutes. That is all. Any questions? Icemen have no need to speak. We have our orders. Besides, we already know the reason. Very well. Platoon dismissed. Then the LT executes a crisp about face, steps off neatly with his left foot, and crumples to the floor with a 50 caliber hole pierced neatly through his skull. I use incendiary rounds cauterizes the wound instantly. I hate blood. Yes, we will drop in 20 minutes. We will meet the Cybos on the field of battle, and we will embrace the cybernetic soldiers as brothers in arms as we face the real enemy. The true born humans who hate us, despise us, and inherently fear us. Mars will be ours. What a more fitting place for a race of warriors. The Ice Men cometh. Replicatoring by Duncan Shields Look, we rescued you, correct? Yeah, but... You were floating in a derelict colony vessel. You were a corpsicle, a cryo-refugee. We could have left you there. Yeah, I know. You revived me and the 200 other surviving sleepers. I get it. I'm grateful. But this is the sixth time, and that's just you. That doesn't count the rest of your kind. Hey, you have to understand, a food replicator is a miracle to us. We're only human. This is the first ship in the Union that will need to place restrictions. The first ship. It's embarrassing. We're imaginative primitives new to your time, like cavemen would have been to us. I'm sorry. Look at this list. You wanted to eat each other? Well, not literally. Just a taste of consequence-free human meat. And once we found out we could submit each other's DNA, it just became a party game. Come on, admit it. You're curious. No, I am not. And from there, it was a small hop to tasting all the species on board we'd never seen before. Those Tuluxians are delicious. I'm a Tuluxian, you monster! Okay, I can see how cannibalism, no matter how victimless and consequence-free, might be frowned on. Oh, can you? Well, I'm glad to see sarcasm is alive and well, but what else have we done that's so bad? The ship's power went down to 15% this morning. Ah, uh, yeah, that. You wanted, uh, let's see, I have it in my notes here. A turducken, but with every edible animal in the universe. Yeah? The main brew screen crashed in the bridge. The whole ship went down to emergency power. So that's what that was. I was getting pretty freaked out. My replicator got super hot. It was trying to complete your meal. Do you know how many edible animals there are in the universe? No. Taking into account there are 8.7 million species on your Earth alone, and there are 237 planets in the Union. Oh. Yeah, your replicator is literally trying to apply the animal within animal to duck in principle to double checking here. Yeah. 2,961,933,238 recorded animals. That's nearly 3 billion layers of meat. 
In the shape of a turkey? Yes, in the shape of a turkey. So you're saying I shouldn't do that again. You can't. We've made it a protocol on the computer. You can no longer do that. Okay. What about an eternal Mobius pizza just slowly coming out of the replicator forever? What? No. Anatomically accurate cakes using medical records of fellow crew members? Listen. Bowls of rice with famous paintings on each grain. Okay, that's it. You're banned. What? We'll bring you replicated nutrients and set up a kitchen in the quarters of you and your fellow awakened cryo sleepers. Let me have the replicator for 10 more minutes, please. I want the replicator to fry me a copy of your delicious dorsal claws. Then we'll be cool. We cool? I terse sucks tears. No, no, we are not cool. Oh, I just knew you wouldn't be cool about this. I should have eaten a copy of your face while I had the chance. By the hammer of Shurindel, such depravity. The restrictions stand. Well, now what are we supposed to do? It's a long journey back to Earth. We have many means of entertainment available. Although, I'm curious, how come you haven't at all been giving us the same kinds of problems with our holodeck? Wait, you guys have holodecks? Can we try that out? That sounds cool. Oh, by Tharlat's hairly claws. Computer, initiate holodeck lockout procedures Alpha Prime. Union personnel only. Oh, come on. You guys are the worst. Clean up by J. Miles. Remote data entry 17 10 94 002112. Origin Earth 50.82 minus 0 0.383835. There's a crater in the ceiling and blood on the floor. It forms a crimson ring around the leg sheets and the pelvic girdle assembly that used to contain Chris. As for Chris, well, that's anybody's guess. But given the wisps of smoke rising from the bowl of the assembly, I don't think he enjoyed his last moments as an agent of our overlords. I don't know what happened to him out there, but he came in with their first wave as an ambassador for peaceful integration. The Chris I knew was gone, replaced by the half-man, half-machine that presumed I'd accept him, it, without a fuss. Chris and I had an intensely physical relationship. This new Chris couldn't partake, but revealed the voyeuristic needs I wasn't up for. Chris took to working extended hours in the spaceport ring, where knocking shops and street walkers were plentiful. He didn't realize that after whatever strange release he needed, his pupils would glow for a few hours. The news feeds were heavily censored, but our overlords were ignorant of the depths of the net. News got out. The overlords were heavy-handed, relying on total eradication of witnesses or terrorist bombings when dealing with any opposition. The day I saw Chris on a video feed, choking the life out of a protester who could have been me. I became a resistance member. Not that there were any clandestine meetings or anything like that. I just took what I did best, chemistry and biology, and applied it to the problem of the ambassadors. Our overlords still hadn't arrived. Some reports said they were desperately fighting off our forces out in the back of beyond and sent the ambassadors as part of an attempt to relieve the pressure on them. So, we had to quickly deal with these things ourselves. I spent a couple of weeks collating whatever dietary and environmental information I could and started experimenting on my resident guinea pig. Three weeks later, I have a smoking pelvis in my kitchen. The clue was Chris's a sudden aversion to salt and vinegar crisps, something he had formerly loved. He had been a bag-a-day devotee and hated being posted to countries where crisps were called chips. He said they couldn't quite get the flavor right. Sodium acetate is the primary ingredient in the flavor of salt and vinegar crisps. It had been easy to obtain, but supplies had dwindled, and I suspected I knew why. And my third test, with baking soda in the sugar and 100 grain vinegar base for the salad dressing, blew Ambassador Crispa Park. I wish I knew the exact reasons, but the disintegration of the torso had removed any autopsy options. Fight on, folks. Earth has got the measure of this infestation now. We'll be clean and clear by the time you return victorious.